Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he knows something that I don't, which is how to make a robot drive in a straight line. Uh, uh, he's competed in Pi Wars since the beginning. Uh, you might have seen Metabot and Pi-Bot in the past, and you almost certainly saw Morley in 2019. So here to tell us all about PID, or is it PID control? It's Lance Robson, everyone. And of course, my machine chooses this moment to lock itself. Aha, right. So yes, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, proportional integral differential control, um, or PID control. Um, and it can be quite a maths-heavy topic. Um, unfortunately, today I've missed out most of the maths. Um, I'm trying to give you uh, an intuitive feel for the subject uh, today. Um, I'm afraid you're going to have to Google it afterwards. And I apologize in advance if any of you already know the subject, because this is going to seem quite light. Okay. Um, so, who am I? Um, so, yes, as, uh, as you just heard, I, I've been in Pi Wars since the beginning. Um, uh, 2020 is the first one that I'm not going to be competing in. Um, and yes, that means I've made all the mistakes. Um, Wally was, was 2019's robot. And Tigerbot, the orange one there with the uh, McCarnan wheels, is the 2018 entry. Um, you can find both of those in the, uh, in the display area if you want a closer look. So, your robot won't drive straight. Why is that? So, there's a bunch of possible causes. Um, so, manufacturing issues are the, are, the, are the obvious one. Maybe you made the wheels very slightly different sizes. Um, maybe you didn't mount them kept the straight on the chassis. Um, uh, the, other, the other cause is that the, the motors don't turn at the same speed. Um, so even if you've made everything perfectly, it still won't run in a straight line. And that can be uh, down to the surface, so you know, a carpet or wooden floor or tiles or gravel or the obstacle course um, will mean that the, uh, the motors don't turn at the same speed. You get manufacturing tolerances problems, um, so perhaps the motors are just different. Um, you get dirt in the bearings, and, uh, and the particular problem for me at home is, is hair getting wrapped around the motor shaft. Uh, <laughs> um, and the, yeah, this, this, uh, this variability can, can manifest as, as uh, especially when you're doing the autonomous runs, you, know, you run your minimal maze code, and you find that the robot doesn't finish in exactly the same spot each time. So when you drive it, it does go in a straight line. And why is that? Um, it's because when you're, watch when you're driving it, you're watching it, and when it drifts or turns, you're steering to compensate. So if we break that down, uh, you're measuring uh, the, the, uh, what you want to control, and that could be position or speed or angle. Um, quite often, it's, it's heading. Um, and then just have the write some code so that the pie measures what's going on and compensates for itself. So how do you measure stuff? Um, so measuring position. Um, so these pictures show a couple of motors uh, with encoders attached. Um, the one on the left is a, a Pololu micro metal gear motor, um, and that's as sold by as used to be sold by Pimeroni. Uh, they're about to sell a, a, a magnetic uh, encoder one instead now. Um, that's got a, a slotted disc at the back there, as you can see, um, and uh, and two light sensors, uh, phototransistors. Um, and the one on the right is a Pololu 25mm uh, gear motor uh, with, with an encoder. That's the kind we used in, in Wally and Tigerbot. Um, and that has a, uh, a Hall effect sensor and, uh, and a magnet attached to the output shaft. And the magnet spins, the Hall effect sensor detects the, the motion and, uh, and gives you pulses. Um, that has a, so that one uh, gives you 48 counts per revolution. Um, and then the, uh, the output of that goes through a gearbox. And so you're getting 900 odd, so it's 20, if it's a 21 gearbox, you're getting sort of 980 counts per revolution, which is a reasonable number. Um, so the output you get from these, uh, from both of those kinds of, of uh, encoder is, is what's called quadrature output. Um, so <laughs> I've tried to show what that is. So if you're measuring your, if, if the two sensors are here, then, then you're getting uh, a pattern uh, a pattern of ones and zeros coming out of the out of the sensors, and uh, they're done like that so that you can tell which direction the motor is turning. Um, so if the current state is is zero zero, uh, so that's phase one in the in the in the graph on the bottom, um, then the next state will either be one zero or zero one, depending on which way uh, 
the motor's turning. So you need something to, to determine which direction the motor's rotating in and to count the changes. Um, so you pick one direction to count up, one direction to count down, uh, and you, you have a circuit or, uh, or, or some code on the Pi that's keeping count of that and, and, uh, and knows exactly where, where that wheel is all the time. And obviously you can turn that position into speed. Um, so it's simply the, time uh, the, the, the position difference between two, two moments in time. So, the, uh, measuring heading can be done another way. Uh, you can do this with gyros, um, or a compass, or a combined unit. Uh, I think Brian, uh, talk, uh, Brian S. was talking about uh, the BNO055 uh, uh, orientation sensor in the last talk. Um, so, if we start off with gyros, typically what you get from, from uh, electronic um, store is, is, uh, is a rate gyro. So, it tells you the rotation rate about the X, Y, Z axes. Um, obviously, if you mount that carefully, um, so you mount that so that uh, one of the axes points in the direction of, that you care about, um, and then uh, then you don't need to do any conversion maths. Um, and yeah, you'll need to integrate the output of that, so it'll tell you that you're rotating at you know 10 degrees per second or something, and you need to integrate that. So every time you go around a loop, you add on um, uh, 10 degrees times the time between uh, the, the, the the length of time uh, between between loops. Um, to get, your, uh, to get your absolute heading. Uh, and the other thing you need to know about is gyro drift. Um, so generally at power up, the gyro doesn't read zero. Um, so you need to take a bunch of samples while your robot's stationary and average them to figure out what the current rate of drift is. Um, so it'll tell you, I don't know, six degrees per second while you're stationary. And then you'll have to take six off of every reading you take from after that. But that drift rate, um, Varies with, is, uh, can vary slowly with time, um, so with temperature or battery voltage changes. So you may need to recalibrate ever so often. Um, although with a Pi Wars uh, event lasting, in Brian's case, 15 seconds, it doesn't really matter so much. Um, a compass uh, is a bit easier. Um, they, 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 give you an a they measure the Earth's magnetic field. Um, they give you an absolute direction, uh, an absolute heading directly, um, but they have a slower update rate. Um, and by that I mean the number of times per second you can ask it uh, which way am I facing. Um, and of course they're effective on metal and magnets um, and, and electrical currents. Um, and obviously every robot's going to have at least two motors in it. Uh, and then the final thing that you can use is, is, a, is a combined unit. Uh, so the, the, uh, the BNO055 for example. Um, and that has uh, compass and gyros in it. It supposedly deals with all the hard stuff for you. Um, and uh, you read it over I squared C and you simply ask it, where am I facing, and it will tell you. So I'm gonna, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about control loops. Um, so open loop is what you generally have to start with. Um, so you're putting in a desired out, you, you put in a desired, um, uh, you put in what you want to get out of the robot <laughs> in at one end. Um, that via usually you have know, the joystick or uh, some code that goes into the controller. The controller decides uh, converts that somehow into into a setting for a motor controller and, and outputs that to the motor controller. And then um, uh, and then the current will go through the motor and the motor will uh, and, and your robot will accelerate. Hopefully, um, what I'm talking about here um, is is uh, is making this this uh, uh, control scheme closed loop. So you're measuring what comes out and comparing that to what you wanted out and doing something different based on the, on the error. So, <laughs> um, if we think about uh, an accelerator in a car, um, when you push down on the accelerator, uh, the car accelerates and how fast it accelerates depends on how far down you press the accelerator. Um, if you imagine you're trying to hold uh, a constant speed, uh, like, your, like the cruise control function in your car, um, that's what we're trying to achieve here. So the desired speed is fed into, into the comparator. Uh, can I actually point? Oh, I can. <laughs> so we feed in the, in, in, in the desired speed here by, by pressing the accelerator. Um, and uh, I'm going to, and I've graphed it here, uh, it's the blue line. 
So if we, well, let's assume we pick a speed and we, and we set and we stick with that speed uh, for the rest of this example. Um, so we take away the current, speed, the current measured speed from the speed we want, and we have an error signal. That error signal goes into a controller, and if we're just doing a, a P controller only, we, we're going to multiply that number by some value we're going to call uh, the proportional gain. Um, and then we feed that control signal into, into the motor controller, and, uh, uh, and, and then the motor controller will, will speed up. So the next time we go around that loop, uh, the error signal is going to be smaller because the motor is now spinning, uh, spinning a little bit. And so eventually you end up with, if we, if we had a totally, and, and that goes around the loop a few times, and if we had a totally frictionless system, eventually the speed would be, uh, would be constant at the desired speed, and the output from the motor controller would be zero. Now, obviously we don't live in a frictionless world, uh, and so what happens is that it will settle at a value that is a bit below uh, the desired speed, and the error will be uh, proportional to, to the losses in the, in, in the system. So uh, in, in a car, it's, it's wind, re you know, wind resistance and, and rolling friction. So how do we get rid of that? Oh, there we go. So we add an integral term. Um, so now our controller is, oh, there we go. Uh, no, perhaps, how do I get back? So we now have an integral term in the controller. So again, our uh, desired speed is coming in. Uh, we, we take it away. Uh, we take away the, the current speed, uh, the error signal. Uh, so we've still got our proportional part, and then the integral part adds up the errors over time. And then we add the, the outputs, and, and we multiply that by the, the uh, integral gain, and uh, we end up with a control signal that's the combination of those two, and we feed that into into the output plant. So if we got to the steady state that we had before with the proportional controller where we're a, a fixed uh, error away from, from the desired value, um, obviously the proportional part will, will start outputting zero. Uh, no, it'll, start output, it'll keep outputting its constant value, and the integral controller uh, value will, will, will start to increase because you're adding up all the errors every time you go around the loop. Um, and that will happen until... Uh, until the controller reaches, uh, reaches the speed that you've asked for. And then you go a bit beyond. And, and then the error will be negative, and then it'll slowly drift back, and you get this kind of wobble around about, uh, around about the, the, uh, the desired speed. So your integral term it corrects for offsets, um, but the downside of it is it causes uh, overshoot and oscillation around about the desired speed. So, so if you have an oscillating system and maybe a robot that's uh, trying to hold a particular heading and it's, and it's wobbling around that heading uh, and you want to stop it oscillating, uh, one way you might do that is to put drag on it, to put your hand on it and, uh, and, and, you, um, and, and the drag force from, from, from putting your hand on it uh, would, would reduce the oscillations. Uh, or you might imagine trying to swing in treacle. Um, so the differential term that we're adding to this controller acts like drag. So again, uh, we are um, so we have the proportional integral parts from previously, um, and uh, we have a differential term. And the differential term is is basically the difference between the current error and the previous error. So it's how fast the error is changing, if that makes any sense. Um, and yeah, uh, the, the effect of that is, is to act like drag on the system uh, and it reduces the oscillations. So intuitively, uh, your proportional gain, <laughs> a higher proportional gain means a snappier control. It means a faster response when you, when you, turn, when you, when you uh, move the joystick or if you, if you tell it uh, turn 45 degrees. Uh, the I term uh, determines how hard the, uh, the controller is going to work against external forces. So, you know, carpet versus hard floor. Um, or wind, or or anything, or uh, or anything really, um, and the D gain works as a, as a damper and reduces the overcorrection and uh, the overshoots. So 
clearly I've talked about these, this proportional gain, this integral gain, this differential gain. Um, what, what do you set them to? So tuning is, is, uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the art of picking those values, and it is a bit of an art. Um, there are some methods that are documented. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into them now. I recommend Googling them later. Um, the approach I've used in robots uh, relatively successfully uh, is, is, uh, is, is increasing the, the proportional gain until, until the robot oscillates and then back it off a bit. Um, and then increase the eye gain until it gets to the set point uh, fast enough um, and maybe oscillates a little bit. And then increase the KD until the oscillations disappear. <laughs> So, as I said before, uh, PID loops benefit from, from uh, being run very regularly. Um, the, the higher the frequency, uh, uh, the faster they can react to, to changes in the system. Um, the, a faster controller is less likely to oscillate. Um, and it's important that the, uh, that the loop is, uh, is run regularly. So it runs, at, you, know, you execute the loop every uh, 20 milliseconds or whatever. Um, so you might consider running this on a, uh, running the, the, uh, uh, the loop on a microcontroller. So TigerBot, uh, which is in the, in the, in the display room, um, it used a Pimer-only propeller hat uh, to run the motor speed control. Uh, so the, the, Pimer, the propeller hat is an eight-core microcontroller. Um, it used one core for, for talking I squared C, um, uh, one core for doing the PID loops for all, all of the motors, and then four cores were used for counting the quadrature encoder pulses uh, so that, to make sure we didn't lose count. And the propeller, uh, the propeller hat is a, is a microcontroller with no operating system, so it can't get preempted. It can't go off and do something else so there's an interrupt or whatever, um, which means that you don't miss pulses from the quadrature uh, encoder, which is super important. Um, if you're doing heading hold, heading hold foot should be fine just to run on the Pi, um, and you're probably fine with just, uh, just a P controller. Um, uh, Brian's... Uh, uh, his heading hold loop ran at 60 hertz in, in Golang on the Pi uh, using the BNO055 uh, sensor. So yeah, the loop needs to run very regularly. You need to trigger it on a timer. Uh, don't use a sleep um, unless you're absolutely certain that your loop takes exactly the same time to run through every time, no matter what branch you, uh, what, what, what if, if uh, branches you're going down. Um, Every time you go around the loop, uh, the controller does something. So the gains have uh, uh, the gains are proportional. The effective gain is proportional to the loop frequency. So if you change the the, the, the loop period, uh, you're going to need to retune the robot. Um, and yeah, the faster the loop runs, the more accurate the control can be. Um, as an example, quadcopters, uh, which need super fast response times so that to avoid dropping out of the sky, uh, their control loops run at like eight kilohertz. Um, on, a, on a fairly small 8-bit uh, microcontroller, in fact. So it's possible. Um, so yeah, the differential terms I've talked about, uh, you just take away the error from the, the previous error from the current error. Um, uh, the integral term, you're adding up the errors, uh, and you need to be careful of it wrapping uh, in, in case you've got a, a language that has a, a, fixed, uh, a, a fixed number of, of bits per... per um, and you, you need to be careful. There's a risk of blowing your motor controller. Uh, so make sure you have current limiting or a fuse or something. Um, the, this, this controller will quite happily uh, set your control. Yeah, th this sort of controller will quite happily set your speed controller to the maximum speed um, and short circuit your battery through your motors. So make sure everything can take it. Uh, and beware of changing the signal to the controller too fast. Uh, because motors are inductive, you can blow your motor controller up that way. And yes, I've done it. So here's a real example of the speed control loop from TigerBot. Uh, it's written in SPIN, which is the language of propeller microcontrollers. Um, so, right, anything else? So this line's getting the desired speed uh, over I squared C. Uh, this is getting the uh, current count from the quadrature encoder. It's not done in the best order, but this is real code, honest. Um, uh, this calculates the last error using the desired speed and taking away the actual speed from the last time, uh, for, uh, sorry, no, yeah, from, from the last time it looped. Uh, this is calculating the current actual speed. 
Um, this is copying the uh, current position into the last position for the next time you go through the loop. And then this is the meat of the, of the, uh, of the uh, PID controller. So it's working out the error, which is the desired speed to take away the actual speed. Um, working out the derivative, which is the error take away the last error. And, there's an integ uh, and the integral is, is adding up the, the last uh, uh, error integral value plus error. I'm not totally sure what this is. <laughs> um, and then we and then we cap the uh, the integral um, to 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 within the maximum and minimum values it's allowed to be. Um, and then here we have the the proportional gain times the error plus the integral gain times the integral value plus the uh, differential gain times the uh, differential current differential value. And then so we set the new speed to be. Uh, so, so this line is is, uh, is 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 capping the maximum rate of change, to of, of speed to uh, uh, to the motor controller, uh, to avoid blowing up the motor, and then we simply apply the speed uh, to to the motor and set last speed equal to the new speed. So yeah. So to summarise, um, to make PID control work, you need sensors uh, to measure the thing that you're trying to control. Um, you can run a PID loop on the Pi, uh, but if you want really fast response, you should consider a microcontroller. Um, PID controllers need tuning, um, but a well-tuned control, a, a well controller will make your robot much more controllable. So when you turn the joystick, it will actually do exactly what you ask it to, no matter what surface it's on. Uh, PID controllers compensate for the environment, so slopes, rough surfaces, turntables. Um, and you'll find that autonomous events are much easier with a PID control robot. There's a couple of shots of uh, Tigerbot and, uh, and Wally on, on obstacle courses from their various years. <laughs> and you'll see particularly here the turntable. So I wasn't turning this at all. I put it on there and the heading hold controller dealt with all of the uh, keeping the robot facing the right way. So any questions? We just picked a value that worked. Um, uh, I mean, a good start is obviously the size of your uh, byte, or the size of your, your, your variable for, for, uh, uh, for holding that. Okay. Thank you. Got time for just one more question. Um, I was just wondering, any tips if you've got multiple control plants, for example, if you're trying to do speed control and heavy control in the same loop, uh, how would you handle that? I don't know. Uh, so, so we we had that, but uh, we were running with speed control on uh, on on the on, on the propeller uh, hat, um, and then the heading hold loop ran on the Pi. Um, that just seemed to kind of work. <laughs> um, the heading hold loop then got, you know, when, when it was asking for, for a particular speed, it just got it. Um, so the loops weren't aware of each other. Um, and I guess we, it's possible we just got lucky. <laughs> oh, 